Miriam with uh, Paolo Di Gian Antonio, foreign com correspondent, war correspondent, uh, anchor man. Um, you, uh, you are moderating the last conference of the Restoration Week 2020. We have been talking about restoration from the field. Now you have the stage today. Uh, we have been using uh, Rigenerazione as uh, a common word for the Restoration Week to represent uh, the connection of restoration with the economy, social and economical life of the place. Now you are talking about synergy. Yes, uh, let me say I I've been for a long time in uh, uh, places where distractions were, were very huge. And now I'm very happy today to stay here just discussing how to rebuild places, how to restore places. Finally, I'm happy of that. Yes, the synergy is the capital uh, world of uh, this discussion because uh, the heritage, wherever it is, is international heritage, is human being heritage. So we must gather, see which forces we have, which strengths we have, and we must share them. And so we, we will be uh, strong enough to win this battle, which is the battle of memory and, of course, the heritage. Thank you, Paolo. Ah, thanks a lot. <laughs> we, are, we are plenty, we are many. It doesn't seem because uh, many of us uh, will uh, uh, speak on remote, but a lot of people is here and we are ready to begin. Thank okay, you. good luck. Good afternoon, welcome, welcome in uh, this uh, final session of this uh, Restoration Week. Uh, you have been in the past days uh, on the ground, on the field. You have seen uh, what our Italian uh, restorators are capable to do. You have been in uh, Amatrice, you have been in L'Aquila, you have been in uh, Santo Stefano di Sessanio. And, uh, you could have the general view of uh, what is possible to do. Uh, now, here, we have the discussion about uh, how we can uh, work together, we can put together our strengths, and so get the best results possible in uh, gathering our forces. Uh, today we are speaking about the important, the very important uh, headline of the economic side of this question. And we have uh, very important persons who are going to talk to us. Uh, many of them are uh, collected. They will speak with us by, uh, by remote because of, of course you know it's uh, the, the problem is COVID-19, but the importance is to share the best ideas we have just to get the best result. So I would say we can uh, begin uh, with the, uh, the regards of, the, uh, of Mr. Carlo Ferro, president of the Italian Trade Agency uh, with his uh, in, in institutional greetings. 
Good afternoon and welcome to the Italian Trade Agency. A special welcome to the Honorable Under Secretary Mario Di Stefano, to the President Alessandro Bozzetti, all the speakers, distinguished guests and participants. Italy is well known for the 3F, food, fashion and furniture that reflect culture and crafting and know-how and territory into product excellence. Restoration is indeed another excellence of the Italian enterprise and even if it doesn't start by NF, it equally reflects our culture, the ability of the Italian handcrafters, technology and the heritage of our territory. You just completed a week of activities and meetings dedicated to the excellence of Italian restoration. We had 33 Italian companies and 148 foreign operators invited by the Italian trade agencies. Most of the audience had the chance to visit the restoration projects in central Italy, from Rome, passing through L'Aquila, Santo Stefano in Sessanio, Città Ducale and Amatrice, and attended to live stream conferences. They had the chance to have a unique experience inside the, what we call in Italy, l'Italia dei Borghi. Each village tells the story of our country to the streets, the walls, the castles and food and landscapes. We wanted the organization for the protection of the Italian heritage to be involved in this restoration week. And I want in this respect to thank the World Bank UNESCO, the European Commission, the World Monument Fund, Europa Nostra for joining us in this initiative. I believe it was worth, and I hope for you, it was worth this week offered to you as an opportunity for also experiencing the professionalism of our companies. Numerous Italian companies and suppliers of different technologies and materials operate around the world especially in the Mediterranean area, but also in many countries in Central and South America, in the Middle East and the area of the Russian Federation. Just to quote some works, the Sheikh Suleiman Mosque in Istanbul, with 25 Italian companies participating in the restoration project, the building in Havana, which will become the headquarters of the new restoration design center, whose works are proceeding now, despite the slowdown due to the pandemic. Major architectural sites in the Mediterranean, such as the UNESCO site Baalbek and the Tiro and Tiro in Lebanon. The Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem, a UNESCO heritage site restored by Italian companies and professionals supported by Italian research institutes. These are just some of the examples. I could continue, but many have contributed to the success of our companies worldwide. But you know, only 5% of what you have seen operates on international markets. Think about how Italian companies can be better enhanced with the contribution of Sistema Paese and with your understanding around the world. The intervention strategies implemented by the Italian trade agency in the field of restoration and conservation in an architectural and urban context are all aimed at promoting Italian companies, whether they are producers of materials, products and instruments, rather than companies that offer design, diagnosing and commissioning. The Italian trade initiatives range from B2B seminars, school construction sites with Italian experts training local experts and jointly carrying out the restoration, as we did in Cuba, with the restoration, or as we did with the restoration of the St. Petersburg Fortress Gate or the one for the Istanbul Clock Tower. In addition, the Italian trade agency accompanies the Italian talents in two international fairs, such as the Heritage in Istanbul, scheduled on November, where we will bring hopefully 21 companies on an Italian pavilion. I like to see a symbolic parallelism between the restoration works you had and the chance to you had the chance to visit in the last days and the activity of the Italian trade agency in these post-COVID period. An unexpected and powerful shock of our society, 
followed by quick and focused reaction. We are working hard with the objective not only to recover, but to perform structural improvements in order for our companies to become stronger while keeping the fundamental roots of their heritage. We are very much involved with the execution of Patto per l'Expo, strongly wanted by the Italian Minister of Foreign Affairs and coordinated by Under Secretary Mario Di Stefano, who I welcome at our event, that I want to thank him for the presence with us and to whom I leave the stage with a renewed support to the restoration companies. Thank you and best wishes. Thanks a lot. Thanks to uh, the president of uh, uh, ITA agency, which is hosting us today here. And uh, uh, you know, uh, our willings, we can say, are infinite but our resources not, unfortunately. This is why cooperation is our key world. Uh, we, we must discuss and find a way to cooperate at our best. I'm coming from uh, Riace in uh, uh, Calabria region, where they are preparing the celebrations for the 50 years of uh, the uh, restoration of the Bronzi di Riace. You know, uh, Bronzi di Riace are two wonderful ambassadors of uh, Mediterranean culture all over the world. And uh, the uh, possibility of using the strength given by the, uh, the Bronzi is something which characterize our, uh, our policy in the Mediterranean. Uh, the hope is that the cultural strength will help even the political and the economical strengths in a very complicated sea, especially in this period. So this is why I would like to ask to come here to Manlio Di Stefano, under Secretary Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, who is dealing every day with the Mediterranean Sea and its problems. Hello. Thank you for this uh, kind uh, invitation today. Thank you for the very nice presentation. And I really would like to... to to tell all pe the people that have been involved in the Restoration Week that this kind of interaction between our country and the experts coming from all around the world is fundamental for us and is giving more strength to the, to the Italian uh, uh, cultural heritage uh, uh, system. So ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I am really pleased to be with you today at the headquarter of the Italian Trade Agency for this conference which represents the closing events of the Restoration Week, a tour across some of Italy's most relevant cities when it comes to safeguarding the cultural heritage. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs is fully engaged in supporting this kind of endeavor, and so are both our trade agency and Asso Restauro, the association representing the Italian company, companies in the restoration sector. I would like to thank them both for this gathering of international experts who have the opportunity to meet and deepen their understanding of the latest uh, Italian techniques directly from our, our en enterprises operating in the most important restoration sites of the country. This time around, in fact, the Restoration Week has taken place in the artistic locations that sadly were hit by the earthquake in the summer of 2016, such as those in Amatrice, L'Aquila, and Santo Stefano di Sessanio. All of the sites visited are part of restoration projects, both creative and environmental ones. As a final destination for the tour, we picked Rome in order to visit timeless artistic and religious sites, which are currently undergoing architectural renewal, sustainable reconstruction, and all other kinds of qualified interventions by Italian companies specialized in the safeguarding of our historical and natural heritage. In the past few days, 
I believe that all our friends coming from abroad were provided with many interesting occasions to discover successful examples of renovation projects. Some accomplished already, while others are still work in progress. We wanted to show you, on one end, the result of these projects, the quality of it, and on the other end, the way the quality is attained by our most experienced companies who have long been in the business of restoring beauty and rebuilding value. The competence required to operate in this sector cannot be acquired from one day to another. A whole set of professional skills and very specific know-how must be developed so as to ensure reliability. Italy has grown a significant national tradition in this area, earned throughout the decades, initially because of our renowned cultural and artistic heritage, which calls for continuous actions and care in order to be preserved and appreciated. Such, such experience has started then to go to the benefit of other countries, where the Made in Italy is supported in terms of expertise and proficiency to get a very skillful job done. This was the case for a number of international projects successfully completed by Italian companies the last few years. From Russia, where they restored the door of Peter the Great in St. Petersburg, to the Turkish mosque of Sheikh Suleiman in Istanbul, to fire beyond in the Middle East, in South America, and everywhere ancient beauty is awaiting restoration. To this end, the Italian trade agency Industrial Restauro have joined forces with UNESCO as well by means of workshops on the conservation processes of archaeological sites, the upgrading of urban centers and the latest technological advancement currently being applied in the field, such as sustainable restoration, an exercise for which Italy is renowned around the globe. I'm confident that thanks to direct contacts between professionals in this area, visits to building sites, observation of innovative working methods and options sharing, we lay the foundation for a path leading to new partnerships for international projects in those markets where the architectonical, artistic, and urban landscape represents an invaluable source of cultural development as well as economic growth. This is a win-win strategy for all state parties involved, for their enterprises and their people. With proficient services rendered by Italian companies, partner countries can take pride, each one in its own national treasures while their citizens may enjoy their cultural to the fullest as they live surrounded by it. In so doing, an economic driven a driver becomes a means of cultural cooperation and vice versa. Culture drives more and more trade and services. In a virtuous and sustainable cycle with a positive ripple effect from tourism to job creation and so on. Hence, the reason for the interest and commitment we are taking at the Foreign First Ministry is in integrating the cultural factor within our trade promotion efforts. Since 2020, as the result of a long due institutional re re restructuring, the Farnesina, as we call the Italian Foreign Office, took over from the Minister of Economic Development the responsibility to endorse trade relations and to assist Italian companies wishing to open up to foreign markets. Action taken and public support offered in this regard are not limited to trade in guts. On the contrary, they aim at making globally accessible all those services that in order to be properly performed come to rely on highly professional skills. This happens in many technical sectors beyond commodities and production industries. One sector where the need for Italian expertise is most wanted appears to be linked to our restoration designers and our enterprises specialized in the conservation of cultural and environmental beauties. So, given the widespread and deserved reputation of Italy in the restoration sector, just like in every other area of Italian speciality, 
and above all the famous 3F, fashion, food, and furniture, our government is implementing a great plan for promoting the renovation industry in the world. The project is called the Restoration Made in Italy. It has a two-year duration and is organized in multiple phases, some of which take place in Italy while others abroad. It consists of a series of initiatives to encourage the knowledge and use of Italian worth in safeguarding the heritage. To achieve this goal, national companies are given support in their paths to internationalization so they may validate the services they offer in foreign markets and not lose any opportunity that should arise on the, on the one end from Italian key qualifications and uh, on the other end because of the ever-growing cultural demand around the world. Many countries, in fact, have now understood the value of their cultural resources and come to see them as a fundamental component of economic growth and development. Unfortunately, because of the pandemics, the calendar of events originally planned in partnership with some of these countries has to be rescheduled. But the Restoration Week ending today represents the best kickoff of the program. Within the legislative framework set up to provide a public response to the current crisis and by acting to establish a synergy between Italian government and the private sector, we count on achieving a greater degree of internationalization for our companies, especially those in the most promising areas for us, such as the restoration sector. In these years to come, we believe that Italian enterprises will maintain their leadership in this field, involving all actors interested in the business of culture with a reliable guide to bring to, complete, to completion their restoration projects thus promoting also the quality of the traditions for which Italy is much appreciated worldwide. I'm very proud to be here today with you, and I thank you all for your attention. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Mr. Di Stefano. Only a few days ago, our hearts were bleeding, watching what was happening in Beirut. Lebanon is a very wonderful country. Lebanon is a country of uh, most important heritage. And uh, this is why we welcome warmly Mr. Sarkis Kouri, uh, Lebanese Director General of Antiquities. He's uh, speaking with us uh, by remote. Dear Excellencies, friends and colleagues, I would like first of all to, to, to thank and congratulate Mr. Alessandro Bozzetti, new president of Assurestauro, wishing him the best in his new assignment. Also, I would like to thank, to thank the ICHI team in Lebanon, especially Mrs. Francesca Zadro for her involvement and support in the previous years and following the recent Beirut disaster. Next. Some of Beirut's most important architectural relics, such as Ottoman and French mandate building isolated structures. They belong to the rare remaining historical quarters and clusters in Beirut. As such, they are nowadays an essential part of its collective memory and history. Next. Many of which constitute a rich architectural her heritage carrying both social and aesthetic significance beyond their historical value. This building that had survived two world wars and a devastating civil war are now gutted. Next. Beirut is severely wounded. The traditional, cultural, and intellectual heart of the capital has been ripped out by the massive explosion on August 4, 2020. That result and the death of more than 200, injuring over 6,000 and creating 300,000 homeless citizens. The most damaged part of the city are the adjacent uh, neighborhoods of Jemaizi and Marmchayel and Ashrafi. This is home to the progressive new generation of artists, architects, filmmakers, entrepreneurs, writers, musicians, designers, and of older residents artisans, craftsmen, teachers, 
and other independent businesses owners who built their lives in these localities over generations, some of whom are descendants of survivors of the Armenian genocides and other minorities. Since 2000, this part of Beirut has also attracted some high-end developments and affluent residents, which aided in transforming these areas into a multicultural heart of Lebanon. Next, please. A team of 40 experts all from the CRC, Centre de Restauration et de Conservation Alumni, founded by the Lebanese University, was specifically tailored to assist the Director General of Antiquities rescuing the city built heritage. Next, please. A report was done of the first days of the explosion, aiming to shortly expose the endangered area. It assessed its significance and its actual situation. It detailed the methodology of, of, to, to follow for the assessment, the diagnosis of their execution, reaching the estimated costs, detailed and action plan to be implemented. Next, please. More than 600 historical buildings were damaged. Among them, 45 required urgent full consolidation and propping interventions and 100 others need to be covered before the first trains. With the preliminary total estimation of damage exceeding the 300 million US dollars. Next, please. Most of the damage of the damaged historical masonry building are located in historical quarters and fabrics, Marmchayel, Saifi, Jumaizi, Joytawi, St. Nicholas, Za Blad, Minat al Hassan Bashura. Next, please. Their main facades, usually overlooking the port, are the most affected since they are facing the explosion area, the historical buildings that got affected by the harbor explosion, show several signs of damages, ranging from loss of opening in the faraway areas to a total collapse of the whole building. Next, please. The first preliminary report included the urgent action for the propping and safety of the buildings and its inhabitants, the restoration of the elevation in order to recover the public space's spirit, and finally, a pilot project for the conservation of valuable built artifacts. Next, please. Urgent action should be undertaken as the built heritage is fragile and many buildings are not safe and could collapse. They need very urgent action for propping and state-of-art structural consolidation in order to address more sustainable actions afterwards. Also, during the first train falls in September and October, roofing works, even temporary, should be executed urgently. Next, please. In line with all above urgent action, the owners should understand that each one should store properly architectural remains of the artifacts that felt during the events. The management of the stored artifacts being amassed building by uh, building. Next, please. Following these urgent actions, the main focus should be on securing the house envelope, the elevations, to ensure the structural integrity of the building, including the roofing. Next, please. Elevation are considered as a public interest. They give the spirit of the public spaces. They would include the following works, masonry, corbels, lintels, architraves and arches, woodwork, steelwork, marbles and balcony, plastering and painting, and etc. These works would protect the interiors of the houses, including the timber ceiling. Next, please. The painted ceilings, such as Baghdadi type, are outstanding pieces of art. The owners would not be able to fund the restoring of such artwork. A pilot conservation project can be launched with high standard experts and selected ceilings that should be conser uh, conserved as testimony of this kind of heritage. Next, please. These landmarks are part of the tangible and intangible heritage of the country and need urgent attention. 
The explosion also threatened to dismantle the diversity of the city. That is crucial to a pluralistic, tolerant, and progressive society. Such serious disruption in the city character will ultimately have consequences on national policy and security. Safeguarding this authenticity of these neighborhoods and its residents is therefore profoundly important to the future of Beirut. Next, please. The DGA action for the recovery of built heritage and uh, under the title of BAC, Beirut Assist Cultural Heritage, has actively started with the phase A, urgent structural propping and sheltering works. Through the collaboration with national consultants and experts and contractors, covering so far 25 houses out of 100 most damaged buildings. Next, please. If not for the incredible solidarity citizens who helped each other in every imaginable way in the immediate aftermath of the explosion, the situation would be far worse. The new generation has nothing left but a spectacular energy, uh, energy and hope to clean the destruction. Restoring gymnasium and Chayil and surrounding neighborhoods not only represent an effort to protect buildings of historical significance, it represents ensuring the safety and survival of citizens who built the city to become a vibrant capital and preserving its diverse nature for the security of future generations. Next, please. At the end, we will take this opportunity to ask, to ask for the assistance of the international cultural heritage community in this extraordinarily dire time to help save Beirut living heritage. And thank you. All the best wishes for Beirut and Lebanon. Thanks a lot. Thank now, you. And activities for uh, cultural heritage. I would like to uh, introduce Miss Giulia Facelli, Policy Officer, DJ uh, Research and Innovation of the European Commission. She's on remote. Good afternoon. I'm very honored to be here representing the European Commission, but also as a conservator engineer and uh, give you a, um, an outlook of what the EU policies are concerning cultural heritage. So the EU policies and initiatives are rooted in the fact, next one, that uh, the EU is funded actually on its culture. The article 167 of the treaty uh, for the functioning of the European Union uh, states, can we see the next one, please? that cultural heritage is in fact at the fundamentals of the European Union and encourages the cooperation between the EU countries while respecting their national and regional diversity. This is indeed very important for the EU because we have to remember that the principle of subsidiarity delegates the member states in taking care of their own heritage, but at the same time recognize the need and the importance of sharing that heritage. A number of uh, policy initiatives have been um, developed throughout uh, a very long history of care for cultural heritage by the EU. I would just like to mention uh, the most recent ones. Uh, the new Urban, European Agenda for Culture, uh, released in 2018 um, in the occasion of the European Year of Cultural Heritage, which have seen hundreds of initiatives coming from throughout all over the European Union and as a spillover the work plan for culture where uh, culture is uh, also seen for its important contribution to sustainability of um, the environmental ecosystems and uh, the EU strengthened the support to the cultural and creative, creative professionals and artists but also the European framework for action on cultural heritage, very specifically targeting heritage, where the um, aim is indeed to promote an inclusive, sustainable, resilient, and I stress uh, this word, 
innovative and globally stronger what heritage not europe because this is what heritage can do for europe and what europe can do for heritage and i really want to stress the fact that the two are coming together the next one please now um these are uh, just a few of the initiatives um policy initiatives at the European level, but also the idea that um, working together with member states means working at a multi-level governance. And the Pact of Amsterdam in 2016 was um, very uh, strongly promoted by member states and their Ministry for Territorial uh, Development for uh, uh, multi-level governance indeed um, and uh, peer learning exercise between member states on urban um, development. Now, urban areas are also the places where in most cases heritage uh, sits and um, it is recognized the very uh, importance of culture and cultural heritage location as well. In this sense, a couple of years back, a um, new partnership under the Urban Agenda for the EU was set up on culture and cultural heritage. I would like to stress that um, it is indeed uh, led by Italy together with Germany, with their ministries of culture and interior affairs. And um, this very interesting um, initiative and group which is uh, composed not just by ministry, but also regional, intermunicipal entities, cities, NGOs, and academia, has come together and prepared an action plan that will still be released and includes a number of topics that I believe would be very dear to your heart, including, of course, resilience of cultural and natural heritage. The next one, please. Now, I'm here today, uh, not just as a representative of the Commission, but also of my Directorate General, which is um, in charge of research and innovation policies. And I would like to give you an overview also on what has been uh, doing in that sense on cultural heritage. The next one, please. I will not go into the details, of course, of how the budget is spent, uh, but I would just like to give you an idea of what the EU considers as an interesting investment on heritage, meaning throughout the past seven years and current seven years of the framework program for research and innovation horizon 2020, 105, around 500 millions of euros have been invested on cultural heritage research and innovation. I stress invested because this is how we would like you to see it as well, because this is a budget that indeed comes from the member states themselves. And it is somehow redistributed through um, research and innovation activities. And these are really going everywhere from bottom up activities on the deep, uh, deeply uh, technological research and innovation on the Marie Curie, ERC grants, mostly academia uh, colleagues will uh, recognize them, but also industrial technologies, uh, support for their development, and uh, trying to, tar to um, tackle some societal challenges, as we call them, challenges that are uh, really impacting all over our societies, and particularly on climate action, environment, and resource efficiency. We have invested quite a consistent uh, um, amount of money especially for energy efficiency adaptive reuse of buildings heritage at risk urban regeneration cultural landscapes international networks all of these specifically on cultural heritage the next one please now a new approach has come up as of 2015, thanks to the support of a um, valuable high-level group of experts, which have come together and developed a report, uh, getting cultural heritage to work for Europe, but I would say also getting Europe to work for cultural heritage, uh, which has highlighted the um, way cultural heritage can actually be a strategic resource. And, um, working out on uh, the sustainability of the heritage because we are aware of the fact that heritage can indeed uh, a preserved and protected heritage can bring um, 
growth, economic growth, job creation, social cohesion for the communities who are actually living close and thanks to that heritage. And I particularly think about the rural heritage and cultural landscapes. Environmental sustainability as well, because adaptive reuse of built uh, heritage, but also historic buildings, it's key to achieving our um, European objectives um, on um, climate neutrality. And uh, in the occasion of the year of cultural heritage 2018, we have put together a um, very nice booklet I would like you to, uh, to check out including quite a good number of innovations developed by these projects um, uh, clustered around uh, four key areas on heritage at risk, um, how to manage together with the local communities and the citizens heritage, the technologies that can actually help us to prevent its um, to conserve it, to maintain it, and how heritage can promote sustainable and creative cities. The next one, please. And um, looking a bit um, more in detail on urban heritage, I would like to um, highlight particularly the work of uh, some of our projects and especially the flagged projects there, ARC, Shelter and Hyperion, who have started one year ago. And uh, you will recognize have quite a number of uh, Italian participants into the consortium, but the added value is really the European component, the fact that um, all these uh, actors are working together, sharing their knowledge and advancing on their knowledge after all. The work of this group of projects is really on the resilience and sustainable reconstruction of historic areas to cope with climate change and hazard events. So here we encompass events like the ones you have um, visited in the past week on uh, earthquake um, destruction, but we look ahead, and I say it unfortunately, to what uh, the climate change will require us in terms of resilience, mitigation, and adaptation. Why do we tackle that much urban areas is because we know that by 2050, we expect to have 85% of European citizens living in urban areas. At the same time, urban areas are also the place with, where 80% of the GDP of member states is created and an almost equivalent amount of resources is drawn from the territory. Therefore, you see the importance of working together with the local administrations, but also the regional authorities and national authorities for urban areas. And heritage is there, is everywhere, is the city centers, is um, all around the city in many typologies of cities. It's a very important component and historic buildings are going to be the key players in the fight against the climate change. A number of other projects are listed here as well. Uh, you're invited, of course, to have a look. They look at heritage from the point of view of the creative cities, of the urban and rural regeneration, of um, adaptive reviews, but also trying to attract investments and create a new uh, way of governing heritage where everyone is included. The next one, please. Can go to the next one also. I'll now give you a very brief outlook of what the next framework program for research and innovation will entail. The question, what is in for you, is because I imagine not all of you and particularly <laughs> Most of you are not much interested in research as such, pure research, but mainly innovation. Still, I would like you to flag the fact that collaborative projects like the ones I just mentioned, where not just academia is there, but you will see we have munici municipalities, industry, um, NGOs, etc., are part of the consortium will still be available under the next framework program. But also uh, linking to what I was mentioning already, a mission, a novelty, one of the five missions, the flagship of Horizon Europe on climate neutral and smart cities. And we clearly understand that built environment being responsible of 40% of CO2 emissions 
will have a key role there. Of course, uh, investments will be available as well. And then two partnership, European partnership on driving urban transitions and built for people, especially the last one has a particular objective on cultural heritage adaptation to um, the requirements uh, ne necessary for the energy efficiency. The next one, please. And for innovators, of course, there will be the European Innovation Council, uh, the EIT kicks that you probably know will continue and a new one will set up on cultural and creative industries, but also InvestEU with its three pillars on funding assistance and the portal will be available and there will be plenty of opportunities there as well for, um, in this case, financing more than funding innovation. Uh, I would like to close with this, um, hoping uh, to uh, have um, a fruitful uh, conclusion of the conference and that you enjoyed visiting um, Italy as Italian. I'm proud of that too. And I leave the floor for the next speaker. Thank you. Thanks, thanks a lot, Ms. Facelli. Now, valuing culture for sustainable and inclusive growth, an urban development approach to heritage, is the title of the intervention of Mr. Sameh Nagib Wahba, Global Di Director, Urban Disaster Risk Management Resilience and Land Global Practice of the World Bank. And so the World Bank is uh, very interesting for us, for the discussion we are going to develop. So welcome, Mr. Sameh Nagib Wahba. Uh, thank you and uh, good morning. Uh, I mean, good morning for those on this uh, side of the world and uh, good afternoon. Um, it's a pleasure for me to uh, join you. Uh, unfortunately, I could not join you in person. Uh, it's a, I'm really sorry that this could not happen, but I would not uh, want to miss the opportunity of being able to share with you uh, how the World Bank uh, looks at issues of cultural uh, heritage. So I'm going to be talking briefly about uh, what culture means for the World Bank, its importance for our twin goals, what uh, is the relevance of culture and cultural heritage for cities, go through a few project examples to give you a flavor of how the World Bank has been supporting this agenda and then share with you some messages in the end. Uh, next slide, please. The World Bank has two twin goals, uh, ending extreme poverty and promoting shared prosperity. And for us, culture is a key to fighting both poverty and inequality, which is about making prosperity for all. In a sense, cultural heritage is critical for identity, for inclusion, for social cohesion, and for the empowerment of marginalized groups. So in this sense, culture becomes critical to ensure no one is left behind, which is, of course, critical because these are the hardest to reach populations to achieve that objective of ending poverty. From a prosperity perspective, one of the critical underpinnings of culture, which is the creative economy and the creative industries, is critical for jobs. I mean, there's 30 million jobs being generated uh, annually. It's critical for income generation, for innovation, for skills development, and for the development and growth of small and micro enterprises. So in a sense, because of its focus on skills development, on the small industries, etc., it has a critical role in, uh, in creating jobs and reducing inequalities for the poorest at uh, 40%. Uh, next slide, please. Within the World Bank, we have had uh, at least over 100 projects, you know, over uh, you know the many years about cultural heritage and sustainable tourism, and we tend to look at them as a uh, composite group of interventions because we want to valorize cultural heritage for economic development. We want to use the heritage assets, you know, its conservation, its preservation, its management, its valorization to create job opportunities, to bring about economic development, to attract uh, tourism, uh, 
create jobs in the tradable sectors that could contribute to economic growth. So that's why we tend to look at cultural heritage, not only with an eye on preservation and valorization of the assets, but of creating jobs and uh, bringing about local economic development. Uh, we have about two and a half billion dollars in active uh, lending commitments uh, for projects that touch upon issues of cultural heritage and sustainable tourism. And we do a lot of uh, policy advisory work for governments and technical uh, assistance. Uh, next slide, please. The approach uh, that we have adopted at the bank is really uh, going beyond just, you know, uh, preservation and conservation to having a more flexible approach such as the historic urban landscape you know that thinks about you know adaptive reuse about regeneration and also to treat it within an integrated approach uh, including also social inclusion and local economic development and livelihoods uh, next slide please why does culture matter for cities well both cultural heritage and the creative economy are important differentiators for cities that are seeking to be competitive in a globalized world. So those cities that are trying to position themselves to attract investments, to create jobs for their population, to create better living conditions, but also do it in an inclusive and livable way, look at leveraging the assets that differentiate them. And here, the combination of their creative economy, their cultural heritage, both tangible and intangible, become very important differentiators in this regard. Next slide, please. Now, historic cores, you know, which in many cities in the developing world are suffering from a combination of very rapid urban growth and urban growth that is uncontrolled, that is not matched by planning and service delivery capacity is resulting in degradation of services, is resulting in overcrowding and deterioration of the built environment. And this has an impact on economic, social, and spatial dimensions. From an economic perspective, I mean, historic cities uh, that are undergoing this rapid informal expansion and um, economic decline tend to see the disappearance of traditional jobs and crafts, loss of skills and incomes, which leaves uh, residents uh, poorer and worse off. From a physical and spatial perspective, the lack of conservation policies leads to the degradation of heritage, the uh, overcrowding in housing conditions, the deterioration of the built environment. And this is coupled with, you know, uh, intensified pressures uh, on infrastructure where the infrastructure is also lacking in operation and maintenance. And therefore, there's a degradation of uh, infrastructure and services, which pushes away uh, the, middle, like the middle class uh, to uh, further out uh, peripheral locations where they might have better housing and infrastructure, leaving downtowns becoming uh, poorer and more marginalized. So how do we approach this? Uh, next slide, please. We look at transforming the degradation of historic cities into a process of urban regeneration that looks at the built environment, at the intangible cultural heritage, just as the tangible cultural heritage as assets that needs to be regenerated for local economic development. So the dual objectives of regeneration combine regeneration of historic cities for its existing communities, the residents of the downtowns, the surrounding neighborhoods, uh, in terms of a livable built environment, in terms of the services, etc. But also uh, they're leveraging as destinations for visitors and tourists both from other countries, you know, and other cities and regions, which would generate revenues and support the livelihoods of people. But equally important is, you know, you, what I've shared with you in these two slides is a process of regeneration of cities from a degradation to urban regeneration. This is not any different from what happens in cities that have gone through, uh, so, so this situation of going through deterioration, urban distress, is not unlike also cities you know, undergoing a disaster due to either an extreme weather event, a flood, a cyclone, uh, or uh, seismic uh, um, hazards uh, such as earthquakes, or cities that are undergoing uh, conflict or you know, uh, um, 
basically a disaster such as the one that Beirut has recently undergone. So in all these cases, urban regeneration, whether they're a combination of, uh, you know, uh, gradual, uh, so either a combination of a shock or uh, stresses uh, and deterioration that happens over time requires a regeneration approach. And in such regeneration approach, as uh, our position paper that we have done jointly with UNESCO, which is called uh, CURE, which stands for Culture in City Reconstruction and Recovery, CURE, we have a framework that basically posits that culture is at the heart or the foundation for the process of city reconstruction and recovery post-disaster uh, post-conflict post or post-urban distress. Why? Because culture combines a combination of place-based strategies and approaches. It's about the valorization, the preservation, the conservation of cultural heritage, its valorization, but also bringing people at the heart of place-based strategies so that you don't have to either choose, do I invest in places or in people? Do I uh, give people a voucher to find a better house or do I fix the housing in which we live? It, can, it does not need to be an either or. Culture is the unifier that brings together place-based strategies and people-based strategies. It ensures that there's a sense of identity that underlies you know, the preservation and the uh, valorization of cultural heritage, that the communities are at the heart of this process, that they contribute to its uh, restoration, that they contribute to its upkeep, and at the same time that there's a sense of place that underlies ways to support uh, communities or people-based strategies in a post-disaster. So for us, culture is the key to unlocking the leveraging of these you know, deteriorated built environment and make them much more livable places, but doing so in a process that is inclusive and that is sustainable. Uh, next slide, please. These are some examples of World Bank finance projects that I wanted to give you a flavor of what we have supported. So this is a project in five cities in Lebanon, including Biblos, Tir, etc., that has pioneered an integrated urban approach to improving services and bringing about livability and the management of cultural heritage. So we've worked over here with a financing that's close to $60 million. This is a financing that was initially approved in 2003 and lasted for uh, over a decade that has improved living conditions in these cities, uh, created conditions for local economic uh, development, for improving the quality of life in the historic centers uh, with a conservation and valorization of existing deteriorated heritage, but it also brought about broader strategy around heritage and focused on ensuring that people through, you know, whether it's artisans or, you know, uh, families in the formal and informal sector benefit from these uh, improvements. Uh, next slide, please. This project in Georgia is a series of regional development operations that have taken two lagging regions, including the Kaheti region in uh, Georgia, which are uh, regions that had uh, either to suffer from poverty, deterioration, lack of investment, and brought an integrated approach. So both positioning them within the overall cultural heritage preservation and sustainable tourism strategy of the country, uh, and investing in urban and rural infrastructure, investing in the development of the private sector in uh, small and micro enterprises, in the conservation of cultural heritage and its management. So among other things to help, for instance, uh, contribute to a process of urban regeneration, the project offered matching grants to uh, property owners who would improve their facades in a way that is preserves the cultural heritage and valorizes it. So this way, it wasn't just about, you know, uh, you know, focusing on the monuments and but also getting the remainder of the uh, urban fabric within a historic urban landscape approach to valorize it and to transform this uh, place in the Kakheti region. The first operation is $75 million, and then we went on with an additional financing and a subsequent project, and it still continues to date, and it has really created important transformation. Projects like the ones in Lebanon and in Georgia, we usually find that a $1 investment in public infrastructure and uh, improvements targeting these areas results in about four to seven dollars of 
private investment in further valorization of heritage, etc. So and bringing about investment to transform these areas. So there's a payoff to public money that's being invested in uh, heritage locations. Uh, next slide, please. This project in, in Gansu in China is one of the poorest regions in China. And here again, similar to Georgia, it is about combining urban and rural infrastructure, a conservation and valorization of the heritage, both the tangible uh, and the intangible uh, within uh, the place, and also with a focus on creating opportunities for the private sector. And here, uh, there were basically uh, micro and small loans to the micro and small enterprises in Gansu, and we entered into a partnership through our uh, private sector arm, the IFC, together with a commercial bank to uh, create a facility that provides revolving loans, micro loans for uh, households and home-based enterprises and small enterprises that are invested in uh, tourism uh, and heritage trades. Uh, next slide, please. So to summarize, I mean, cities need to create jobs to attract investment and talent if they are to prosper, to become more competitive and to contribute to growth and poverty alleviation. And for them to be able to attract the investors and the talent, they need to offer quality of life, amenities and high quality services. It's about education, it's open space, it's parks, it's the cultural heritage that is key to attract this talent and these investors. And for that, a conservation of cultural heritage is critical for the urban revitalization of these historic centers to make them differentiated and livable places. At the same time, the other underlying dimension of culture, which are the creative industries and the creative economy, contributes to city livability and to job creation. So when you add those two together, you know, cultural heritage and the creative economy, they become foundations to differentiate cities, to help them become livable, competitive, and at the same time, inclusive. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks a lot. And now let's think about cultural, cultural uh, heritage from a global point of view and uh, global challenges and the role of heritage is the title of the intervention of uh, Mr. Jonathan Bell, PhD, Dr. Vice President, Programs World uh, Monument Fund. Hello and uh, good afternoon. And for you, the microphone, the remote microphone. <laughs> good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for this kind invitation for the World Monuments Fund to participate in Italy Restoration Week. Um, I only regret that I cannot be there in person, but I know many of you there in Rome have had the pleasure of speaking with my colleague, Alessandra Perzetto, who is herself a native daughter of Italy. Uh, and so I know those conversations have, have gone well. Um, the theme today is heritage and policy, and really thinking about long-term impact of the work that we all do. So I thought I would uh, take a few moments to highlight how World Monuments Fund is working to address not just the immediate needs of heritage sites, but also consider how our engagement with the world's cultural heritage can contribute to addressing some of our greatest challenges. Next slide, please. So uh, first, a little background uh, on us. The World Monuments Fund is a private, non-governmental organization dedicated to safeguarding humanity's significant cultural places to enrich lives and build mutual understanding. This year is actually our 55th anniversary, so we have a bit of history. Uh, and in our very first year, we mobilized resources and support for the severe flooding that ravaged Venice in 1966. So we have a long history with Italy and sites in Italy and its rich, rich cultural heritage um, that really go back to, to our very beginning. Since then, we've had a wide range of products in the country, including uh, the Foro Barrio in, there in Rome, um, working again in Venice to consider the role and impact of tourism in the city, and uh, recently developing work to contribute to the recovery in Amatrice after the earthquake, a site that I know all of you visited during this past week. But I'm going to focus today on our work outside of Italy, uh, because I think that's something that we can bring to this conversation in, in an interesting way. 
Next slide, please. Since our founding, we have worked on over 600 sites and raised more than $300 million for projects. In some cases, we have long-term commitments, such as at Angkor Archaeological Park in Cambodia. Uh, we've been working there on four individual sites within the archaeological park since 1989. We have a team of 100 workers comprised of locals from within and outside the park. And we've really invested there in capacity building, uh, developing a team of principally local Cambodian conservation professionals who oversee all the work at the site. Uh, and as would be necessary for such a long-term commitment, we work very closely with the government there, uh, the government entity that oversees the park and sets policy for work there, really helping to influence um, the approaches that are taken at the sites we work and beyond. Next slide, please. So as we look to the future and think about how to increase our impact as an organization and as a member of the global cultural heritage community, we've identified three key global challenges that we feel our work can help to address. The first is tourism. Now, we all know that tourism presents both an opportunity and a challenge for heritage places. Uh, mass tourism can tax local infrastructure and have negative impact on historic fabric and the resident communities. At the same time, not enough tourism, as we see today as a result of the current global health crisis, means many heritage sites do not have the revenue needed for consistent management and necessary maintenance. Over our years of experience, we have worked to develop alternatives to provide would-be tourists virtual visitation opportunities to protect fragile historic fabric. As we see here at the Church of San Pedro Apostol in Andalias, Peru, which sits in a town of only 6,000 people, but is on a very popular tourist route and can be overrun at times. So here we developed an interactive online platform to be able to visit the church and the rich murals and the gilded decoration of the building. And I should say that this building is known as the Sistine Chapel of the Andes. So uh, it is really quite richly decorated. And through this platform, one can zoom in and explore the building and really see details that one would never be able to see in person, providing an alternative to visitation in person. Next slide, please. On Rapa Nui, often called Easter Island off the coast of Chile, we have also had a long-term and ongoing involvement for decades. Uh, in recent years, we focused on development of tourism infrastructure and interpretation, working closely with the Chilean authorities and the local community who manages the island to build pathways and a visitor center. We work to improve visitor management for the security of the rich heritage and also for the benefit of the visitor experience at the same time informing policy development. Our approach has supported increased visitation while also mitigating the threat that more visitors can represent to a site. Currently, we're also working on the island to understand the risk of sacred rock carvings uh, at risk of falling into the sea and being lost forever. So policies that protect heritage from unfettered tourism ultimately support the establishment of sustainable approaches that preserve both heritage sites and communities and their way of life. Heritage places can also dramatically highlight what imbalanced tourism, that is far too many visitors or a lack of visitation, really does to a place and help shape the policies to encourage and manage tourism for the benefit of the community and the heritage. Next slide, please. The second global challenge we've identified is climate change. And I know that's already been mentioned a few times today. Um, in this case, we are working with the national government of the Maldives to develop a World Heritage Site nomination dossier for a series of coral stone mosques. These mosques, mosques are constructed of coral harvested from the sea, dried and carved with intricate motifs with influences from across the region. As many of you will know, the Maldives is the lowest lying country in the world, with the average elevation only one and a half meters above sea level. So they are 
greatly impacted by the effects of climate change and the associated sea level rise, um, which really represents a critical threat to the entire nation and all of its heritage. In the work we're doing with the government of the Maldives, we're trying to integrate Great climate change adaptation strategies for this specific site uh, and this, the, the multiple mosques that we're working with that can both safeguard the mosques against flood risk and also provide model for replication in, in other parts of the country uh, and ways to address other threats posed by climate change. Next slide, please. A key part of supporting and developing adaptation strategies is the highlighting and legitimization of traditional and land management practices. At the World Heritage Site of Kilwakisiwani in Tanzania, one of the crowning cultural achievements of the Swahili coast, we revived and strengthened practices related to mangrove planting and cultivation, which helped mitigate the impacts of coastal erosion exacerbated by sea level rise. We also work to stabilize the walls of the fort and strengthen them against the ravages of the local climate. This project highlighted for the government of Tanzania the importance of traditional management systems that they now continue to support. Next slide, please. Uh, at our current uh, project in, uh, in India, the site of Taj Baudi in Bijapur in South India, we're working to re rehabilitate traditional water management systems uh, on the Deccan Plateau of the country. Um, traditionally, these cisterns of water provided a source of clean water for hundreds of thousands of people in times past. Um, over the years, uh, lack of, of care and abandonment have meant that many of these are not functioning as they once did. And as we look at rising temperatures and altering rainfall patterns, there is a change in the availability of water that will become a larger challenge as time goes by. And for this, such traditional systems of water management are a truly important solution for future water needs. And the state government now is encouraging the rehabilitation of these traditional water management systems like this. So in the case of climate change, policies that protect heritage and support continuation of traditional resource management contribute to strategies that make communities and places more resilient. At the same time, adaptation strategies developed for cultural heritage places can have impact, can impact the communities around them since they can benefit from the outcomes and replicate some of these strategies for other purposes. So policies to fend against climate change can benefit both significant cultural sites and the nearby homes and businesses. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Our final, uh, our final global challenge is underrepresented heritage. And this relates to heritage and narratives that have not always received the recognition deserved or enjoyed by others. Um, at the site on the screen here, Mamrashan Shrine, uh, this is an important Yazidi religious pilgrimage site in Iraq um, that was largely destroyed by ISIS or Daesh in, in Arabic as part of an attempted genocide of the Yazidi people. Even before the actions of Daesh, Iraqi authorities had relocated the Yazidis into collective towns uh, back in the 1970s. And the Yazidis are a community that have been established in small scattered villages across Mount Sinjar from as early as the 12th century. So they have a long standing presence and cultural overlay of the landscape there. We are working with the local Yazidi community to rebuild the shrine both as a symbol of resilience of the community itself, but also as a beacon to call back Yazidis who left, who fled, uh, highlighting the, the, their reinforced presence and the international recognition of the community now in Mount Sinjar. Next slide, please. In the United States, uh, World Monuments Fund recently had a collaborative project highlighting civil rights uh, and, and the sites related to civil rights movement across the American South in the state of Alabama. The project collected the stories of individuals who participated in the civil rights movement of the 1960s and highlighted some of the locations that were the sites of key events where communities came to gather and fight oppression. The result has been greater recognition for the struggles for equality under the law by a large group of Americans. 
And the project, which resulted in a website that allows one to hear these stories and visit these sites, uh, ended up being a really timely tool and reminder of the struggle, given the context of the recent international groundswell of the Black Lives Matter movement. The sites that were part of this project have since gained recognition and earned official protection in many cases at a number of levels, both local and national. The protection and recognition of the heritage of multiple groups and communities help strengthen and support human rights. Policies that safeguard the cultural expression of humankind and share these stories and experiences of our communities contribute to mutual understanding and a thriving, diverse global society. The relationship between policy and heritage can and should be mutually beneficial. Sound policy on the one hand creates a context that supports sound preservation, rehabilitation, and valorization of cultural heritage. In turn, cultural heritage work can effectively impact and shape policy to ensure that all the outcomes of our work are long lasting and contribute to rich, vibrant, and thriving global community. Next slide, please. And so with that, I will thank you all very much and uh, turn it over to the next speaker. Many thanks. Thanks, thanks a lot. And now we have uh, Europa Nostra, uh, our Europe. Uh, we have uh, Sneska Kwed Vilieg Mihailovic and Guy Klaus, and they are Secretary General of Europa Nostra and Executive Vice President of Europa Nostra. They are discussing about uh, COVID-19, beyond COVID-19, what can cultural heritage can uh, do for Europe and what Europe can do for cultural heritage. Dear colleagues, cari amici, I very much regret not to be with you today in Rome. But thanks to digital technologies, um, we can be connected with each other even if we are obliged to remain physically apart. Let me congratulate the organizers of the Restoration Week 2020 for the excellent quality of your program, and also let me thank you for having invited Europa Nostra to contribute and participate in this important event. I'm sure that you have had a most enriching and inspiring experience with your wonderful Italian hosts during your visits and discussions in stunning heritage places, including the medieval fortified village of Santo Stefano di Sesanio, and the extraordinary Basilica di Santa Maria di Colemaggio in Aquila. These two heritage sites, as you very well know, are both proud winners of one of our European Heritage Awards, run jointly by Europa Nostra and the European Commission. Special greetings to Alessandra Vitorini, who has taken part in the Restoration Week 2020 and who has been responsible for a formidable team in charge of the very complex and very brave conservation project which has resulted in the renaissance of Colemaggio. We are very, very proud to have you as the ambassadors of heritage excellence in Europe and beyond. I'm grateful for the opportunity which you have extended to Europa Nostra to share with you our thoughts on some latest European policy developments with regard to cultural heritage. I'm also pleased to be one of the civil society voices in this debate, alongside the Getty Institute and Foundation and also the colleagues from the World Monument Fund with whom we currently collaborate within an EU-funded project called Illucidare. Just a few words about my organization. Since its foundation in 1963, Europa Nostra has been raising awareness about the extraordinary value of cultural heritage for Europe. We have been lobbying to place cultural heritage higher up on the agenda of European institutions. We have been celebrating heritage excellence through our European awards. And we have also been campaigning to save Europe's endangered heritage. Our executive vice president, Guy Klaus, will tell you more about this important aspect of our work. 
Our large pan-European network is composed of over 1,000 individual members and of more than 350 member and associate organizations from across Europe and beyond. And we are very proud of our large European family in Italy, composed of over 20 heritage organizations, including Italia Nostra, Fondo Ambiente Italiano, and Comitati Privati per la Salvaguardia di Venezia. Come vedete, Europa Nostra si sente veramente a casa in Italia. The topic of the Restoration Week 2020 and the aims of this Restoration Week are fully in line with the mission and work of Europa Nostra. And the emphasis on quality restoration as well as on the importance of the restitutione, the return of heritage places to the communities, is now more timely than ever. We must never forget that heritage belongs first and foremost to the community, and not only to the specialists, and that the heritage sites, with no link to the community, lose its, its meaning. Therefore, what a beautiful coincidence that a conference takes place in the very week when Italy has finally completed the ratification of the Faro Convention, the European Convention on the Value of Cultural Heritage for Society. Well done, Italy. May also other European countries follow your power of example. The case studies that have been presented during the Restoration Week 2020 perfectly illustrate that our cultural heritage matters for Europe and its citizens and communities. For the future, we remain at your disposal to share with you other inspiring achievements that have received one of our awards. All these excellent examples highlight the immense benefits and multiple value that cultural heritage has for Europe. Let me mention only some of these benefits. Cultural heritage contributes to our economy by creating highly Skill, highly quali high, high quality skills and rewarding jobs. And also by stimulating tourism. It is estimated that cultural tourism accounts for at least 40% of all European tourism. This is certainly true for Italy. Cultural heritage also contributes to our society by providing meaning and a sense of identity to people and by contributing to our individual and collective well-being. Cultural heritage, finally, is also an asset for our environment, among others through the quality conservation and reuse of historic buildings in harmony with their surrounding landscape. All these messages are reflected in the text of our European Heritage Alliance Manifesto, entitled Cultural Heritage, a Powerful Catalyst for the Future of Europe. This manifesto was presented by Europa Nostra together with 49 members of our European Heritage Alliance, in the middle of the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic on 9 of May, the Europe Day. Since then, this manifesto has been signed and endorsed by over 800 distinguished heritage professionals and is available in 20 languages, including Italian. And if you haven't done it yet, I warmly encourage you to sign it and disseminate it. Together, our voice will be more powerful and influential. Through the Europa Nostra Liaison Office in Brussels, which is located at the very heart of the European Union decision-making, we are working tirelessly for this message to be heard and understood at the highest political level. And I'm delighted that my colleague, Lorena Aldana, who is responsible for European policy coordination at our Brussels office, was able to spent a week with you in Italy. Together, and especially thanks to the work of our Brussels office, we conveyed this important manifesto to the presidents of all EU institutions, to all EU heads of state or government, and of course to all EU ministers of culture. And we are convinced that our mobilization will bring tangible results. Last week, the President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, 
addressed the European Parliament to deliver her first State of the European Union speech. In this visionary speech, she highlighted that Europe's recovery is not just an environmental or economic project, but also a true new cultural project for Europe. Speaking about the European Green Deal, the President of the European Commission has also called for the creation of a new European Bauhaus, a co-creation space where architects, artists, students, engineers and designers will work together to match style with sustainability. We must ensure that cultural heritage stakeholders are part of this ambitious cultural endeavour. We must make good use of this policy momentum also to support the need for proper training, exchange and promotion of heritage skills in Europe. As you in Italy rightly perceive heritage skills as being an asset for the Made in Italy brand, we should also make good use of heritage skills as an asset for the Made in Europe brand. Europe is indeed globally renowned for its high quality skills in the field of cultural heritage preservation and conservation. Therefore, heritage skills and savoir-faire should also become an important driver for cooperation between the EU and the rest of the world. Of course, this process should be a mutual learning one and not merely the export of European skills, models and techniques. We must foster heritage-led international relations for the benefit of a better understanding of a shared past, present and future between Europe and the rest of the world. And this is precisely what is happening during this Restoration Week in Italy, thanks to the fruitful exchanges between colleagues from Albania, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, USA, Tajikistan and other countries in Europe. Dear colleagues, at the time when the EU is busy shaping the most suitable recovery instruments to repair the damage from the crisis caused by the, by the pandemic and to prepare a better future for our next generation, we must join forces to place culture and heritage where they belong, at the very heart of the European project. We at Europa Nostra we shall continue to advocate for a true European New Deal for cultural heritage to be incorporated across many policy areas and priorities. We are indeed convinced that the European Union of shared values must be as important as Europe's economic, monetary or political union. So let me finish by launching an urgent and vibrant call. Let us work together to ensure that cultural heritage is fully recognized as an invaluable resource and powerful catalyst for the green, digital, resilient and creative future, not only for Europe, but also for the rest of the world. I wish you an enriching last day of the 2020 edition of the Restoration Week and a wonderful end of your stay in Città Eterna of Rome. I thank you for your attention. While you put on the slide, let me say that Sneska and earlier in the week also my colleague Lorena Aldana have been highlighting among the activities of Europa Nostra the awards which are given for particular particularly well done restorations in the cultural heritage field. Now, there's the other side of the coin also. You have heritage, which is particularly in danger. And in particular, also before, the Jonathan Bell was mentioning a couple of cases in his presentation. Now, at Europa Nostra, we have launched, as from 2013, a special program for cultural heritage in danger called the seven most endangered program which has been launched together in cooperation with the european investment bank institute and it consists in selecting in the meantime every year seven pro seven projects let's say seven 
cultural sites which are in a particularly difficult situation and which, if nothing is done, will ultimately disappear. And we try to save those basically through two uh, uh, complementary approaches. One is to raise the visibility of, and could I have the next slide perhaps? Uh, one is to raise the visibility of the site because quite often, if nothing is done, it's because nobody is really too much aware of its existence or is not feeling strongly involved in saving it. So we try to increase the visibility and at the same time, we also try to increase the credibility in the sense that we send in a technical team, which is making a concrete proposal on how one could tackle any kind of restoration of the site. So on the one hand, we try to say, this is important to do. On the other hand, if you want to do something, here is a first plan how you can do it. And as I said, we do that together with the European Investment Bank Institute. And at the, same, at the first reaction, you could say, well, why would a European Investment Bank get involved in a cultural heritage? Now, I understand from the presentations I heard before, in particular from the representatives of the European Commission and of the World Bank, that indeed, uh, they are also convinced that it makes economic and business sense to save endangered heritage. However, let me say, I think between uh, the people involved in that sector, we can kind of agree on that. But I have worked myself 30 years at the European Investment Bank, and I know uh, that if you meet hard-nosed financiers, people from the ministries of finance, also from the regions, it is not always such, so easy to convince them that really investment in cultural heritage is as important as investment in a number of other sectors competing for the same resources. Um, so uh, let's move on to the next slide. And what I would perhaps like to say also is it is important that we increase the visibility and the credibility of the sites, but you can ultimately only save such sites if you have a strong local base. You make or break such a project at the local level, not, so to say, from Brussels or from The Hague, where our main office at, of Europa Nostra is, or from Luxembourg, where the European Investment Bank would be located. Here you have the seven so, uh, most endangered sites of 2016. Indeed, 2016 was a special year because we had seven, because we also included Venice as what we call the most endangered site in Europe. And I'm afraid this has not yet changed uh, between 2016 and uh, 2020. Now, if you look at these, uh, sites here. It's, I chose 2016 for two reasons. To we'll talk a little bit more in detail. One is the experience is it takes some years before really nominating and selecting a site for being a seven most endangered site. It takes some years until really progress normally is visible. And second also 2016 has been a year where we have seen very nice success as well as uh, failure. And I'll explain to you, though, if you take the case in the middle below, you see a bridge. It's a bridge of, in, of Dieppe in France. And this bridge, which is from the time of Eiffel, uh, was to be replaced by a new one and we managed to avoid that. So the bridge continues to be used and indeed has just this year been classified as Monument Historique, which is the highest uh, nomination, uh, the highest uh, status in that respect. And from that point of view, that bridge is definitely saved for the future. On the other hand, if you take the case on the upper right, you have 
the, the very old city of Hassan Cave in eastern Anatolia, in Turkey, and that city is just being drowned in a in the dam on the Tigris uh, River, which flows past that city. Admittedly, a few of the main buildings have been saved, and as in the earlier days in Abu Simbel, put up on a different side, but still the main, the city as such is basically lost, which for a place which has been uh, where you had people living for 11 to 12,000 years is very much a pity. Uh, the other places I can mention there, you have on the left upper uh, side, you have a basilica in uh, Armenia, where there is now a serious relaunching effort being prepared. Uh, you also have uh, the island of Chios, parts of the island of Chios, where so far less progress was made. Further below, you have uh, Patarei, which is a sea fortress in Estonia, in Tallinn, where there is a fairly good chance that a recent privatization will take up that project and uh, make something quite sustainable out of it. Uh, further on the right side, you have a monastery in, uh, in Spain, where so far less in Estremadura, the Estremadura region, where so far less success has been noted. And further below on the right side, the uh, former uh, airport in um, Finland, in Helsinki, where again, uh, not very much um, not very much success so far has been done so you can see success and lack of success being uh, as you would expect being uh, the case when you have seven most endangered which really are um, as i said before among the projects being in a particularly bad shape respectively having to fight against a particular lack of attention if I can go down to the next slide, please, I will be more rapid there. There you have the corresponding seven sites selected for 2018. In terms of countries, you have uh, Bulgaria, you have Albania, you have Romania, Turkey, UK, Georgia, and uh, the, the last one is the city of Vienna in Austria. Uh, for these projects, again, the results so far are a bit mixed, but for instance, the Romanian project, which is in Constanta, a former casino, is being restored and, and uh, is moving on. Uh, for the project up on the left side uh, is a Brutalist style architecture in uh, Bulgaria. Again, first works are going on. Uh, the one on the left, sorry, you went, can we go back? Thank you. And uh, the one on below is a number of monasteries in uh, the site of David Garechi in Georgia, where again, uh, a number of efforts are ongoing. And perhaps in just to move on to the next slide, could we move to the projects for 2020? Thank you. Obviously, it's too early to say a lot about projects in 2020 uh, because uh, it takes some time. And this year, in terms also of uh, coronavirus, was not exactly a year where it will be very easy to undertake the necessary technical visits. But I would simply there highlight two projects where, to my regret, I must say, they are being lost. One is on the top uh, left case is the National Theatre of uh, Tirana, which simply has been demolished in a fairly abru abrupt le way, let's say, by the city. Uh, the one on the upper right side is the so-called Y-block 
in Oslo, in Norway, where again uh, the uh, destruction of the building is ongoing. At the same time, there are some efforts done in order to save the uh, the facade part, which has been uh, shaped by Picasso, at, which you see on the photo. Um, if we can move to the next slide, then there you have a map of the seven most endangered sites until 2020. And as you can see, it covers fairly well all of Europe, Europe in the definition of the Council of Europe, so accordingly going all the way up to Russia on the one hand and to Azerbaijan uh, further south. And I would still like also, if we can go to the next slide, and rather than going into detailed uh, descriptions of individual projects, I've tried here a little bit to um, draw some more general co conclusions in the sense on the one hand, what is or what can be the main reasons for sites to be endangered? In most cases, it's simply neglect. But you can also have uh, projects which are in danger because of planning dangers, because of there's some, like Dieppe, the bridge I mentioned, was one of those cases and one of the more successful ones. And you can also have uh, projects which I call here advocacy projects, which is really a project where so somebody has clearly a different plan for the site than the maintenance of the cultural heritage. Hassan Cave in Turkey is a case I mentioned before. I could also mention like Ostia Montana in Romania, where uh, the question is between mining on the site, continuation of mining, or to, uh, to maintain the corresponding uh, cultural heritage site. And also it will be different whether we talk about projects which basically are composed of one building or of a complex or of many buildings and many owners, because quite often that makes it a bit more difficult. And next slide. Again, on the, along a similar uh, line of thinking, you can also uh, look at the question, how far is there an urgent need for funding? Clearly enough, in a number of cases, funding is a major issue, even though experience shows that if you have a good case, if you have raised the visibility and the credibility of the case, you may you have good chances to also uh, find the necessary funding resources. And accordingly, uh, you will have the case where funding is very crucial or where it even may be simply less important. Again, the, the Dieppe bridge I mentioned before was a case where funding was not an issue on the contrary. Maintaining the bridge would did even save money. And in the case of Hassan Cave, again, it was not a question of funding. It was a question of incompatibility between a, an infrastructural project and the maintenance of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the historic city. And I think I will leave you with this, uh, these few considerations. What I, next slide, please. What I would still suggest is here you have the various places where you can find more information, including also specifically on the seven most endangered, all the reports which have been done for each site are available on the corresponding websites. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks a lot. And now uh, let's talk about Italy with Mr. Luca Maestri Pieri, General Director of the Italian Agency for Development Cooperation. Uh, is titled The Protection of Cultural Heritage for a Sustainable Development in the Italian Agency for Development Cooperation Projects. Uh, thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, let me thank the Italian Trade Agency and Asso Restauro for the invitation to this very interesting workshop. 
And I would like to thank also Under Secretary Malio Di Stefano, which opened this session, and all the other distinguished speakers that we heard today. The Italian Agency for Development Cooperation is very active in the ongoing international scenario and debate on the connection between the protection of cultural heritage and development with a particular attention given to all documents, exercises, and opinions which are expressed by international institutions and organizations such as World Bank, OECD, and in particular, UNESCO. Let me here recall what, uh, what is emphasized by the preamble of the UNESCO Constitutive, Constitutive Act. I quote, the wide diffusion of culture and the education of humanity for justice and liberty and peace are indispensable to the dignity of man and constitute a sacred duty which all the nations must fulfill in a spirit of mutual assistance and concern. It is also in view of this principle and to achieve these goals that the three-year programming and policy planning document on development cooperation, which is the highest document adopted by Italian government for development cooperation, includes protection of cultural heritage as a priority area of intervention for our action. The spectrum of the areas of intervention is broad, including intangible cultural heritage, traditions, artisan knowledge, cultural and creative industries, sustainable tourism. The main objectives are exploiting the potential of culture to promote a sustainable social and economic development as a source of growth and employment, and promoting the values of identity and the sense of belonging to community. Strengthen intercultural and interreligious dialogue, recognizing the value of cultural diversity and promoting respect for human rights. Raise awareness and understanding of the importance of tangible and intangible cultural heritage. Just to give you an overall picture of the agency's commitment in this sector, I will provide you with some figures. Since its inception in 2016, uh, the agency has approved more than 200 projects in the sector of cultural heritage for a total budget which raises more than 100 million euros. We are implementing projects in almost every continent, with particular reference to some of the countries where we have the priority actions in place. And just to name a few of them, I can quote Bolivia, Myanmar, Cuba, Burkina Faso, Lebanon, Jordan, Mozambique. Just to give you some examples of the projects, uh, uh, just a few of them, a very few of them, I can recall the World Heritage Site in Bamiyan Province, Afghanistan, where in collaboration with the University of Florence, we are running a project with an integrated approach conceiving the archaeological site as a socioeconomic and environmental context combining urban planning and restoration management. I can quote also the, the, the spectacular Bagan, Bagan archaeological site in Myanmar, which I had the chance to visit before this pandemic took place last January where we are supporting local authorities to include it, the Bagan site and also the old PU cities in the World Heritage List of UNESCO. In Vietnam, we are engaged in improving the management, restoration and conservation capacities of Vietnamese institutions and organizations specialized in cultural heritage protection and in improving conditions of the archaeological sites in Quan Nam province. In particular, we are managing restoration training sessions through learning by doing activities at Misson archaeological site. In Jordan, the agency is proud of its continuous involvement in the preservation of important sites of national and cultural heritage to safeguard Jordan's legacy from the past. AIC's programs have included disaster risk management in the Sikh of Petra, 
the famous ancient capital of the Nabataean kingdom, and one of the world's richest and largest archaeological sites. And here we have a program launched in 2012 that aims to prevent and mitigate landslide-specific risk in the sick. And IACS there is also supporting the creation of the Regional Institute for Restoration that will be dedicated to the protection, conservation, and restoration of mon monuments, archaeological sites, and World Heritage Tourism sites for the region. We have also initiated collaboration with the European Union authorities. And in this field, we are implementing about 11 projects with the EU Commission's fundings in different sectors for a total amount of more than 120 million euro. Actually, we are in the final steps of negotiation with the European Union for several additional projects, including an important initiative in the cultural sector in Albania, where we will implement a project to rehabilitate the outstanding archaeological park in Bilis. The agency is also part of the EU Practitioners Network, joining the Task Force on Culture and Development, where it is currently participating to the comparative mapping exercise of developing development cooperation initiatives in the cultural heritage and cultural sector. These figures clearly highlight the Italian government's strong commitment to support development cooperation initiatives in the heritage and cultural activity sector and suggest the opportunity to, of implementing a systematic common approach in the cultural sector with all other Italian stakeholders, mainly with the other Italian institutions. And it is in this regard, even in the light of this workshop, that I think it is, it is time to consider and evaluate the room for strengthening our relationship also with our friends of ICE in order to maximize the synergies and the collaboration, taking into account the respective missions and goals. In conclusion, I uh, again like to thank ICE for the opportunity given to our agency to emphasize before this audience the efforts made so far and the fundamental role given to cultural sector in the development cooperation system. Thank you. Thanks, thanks a lot. And now let me introduce uh, Romina Surace, a restoration project coordinator of the Symbola. Uh, her, uh, she's talking about culture, identity, and knowledge, the roots of the future. Buonasera a tutti. I start from scratch. So, good Sono afternoon. Romina Surace e lavoro all'Ufficio di Ricerca della Fondazione Tibola, una fondazione del terzo settore che cerca da più di 15 anni di mettere insieme diverse parti della società, in modo dell'impresa, delle istituzioni e dell'associazionismo per favorire un modello di sviluppo basato sulla qualità. Oggi sono qua eh, in veste sostitutiva del Presidente della Fondazione Ermete Galacci, di cui vi porto i saluti e le scuse per non aver potuto partecipare di persona a questo evento e da parte mia mi scuso per non aver avuto il tempo sufficiente per preparare una, prepara una presentazione in inglese. Ma veniamo al motivo per cui sono qua oggi, ovvero quello di anticiparvi alcune eh, cose eh, che riguardano appunto questo ultimo lavoro di ricerca che ci ha visto impegnati negli ultimi mesi come fondazione insieme a un'azienda eh, fatta a Bortolo del, dell'edilizia italiana e in collaborazione con Astore Stauro. Questo lavoro di ricerca eh, verrà pubblicato prossimamente, sarà redatto in lingua italiana e inglese e eh, il titolo eh, è quello 100 Italian Architectural Conservation Stories. È dedicato infatti al racconto di questa filiera made in Italy eh, legata al mondo del recupero e restauro architettonico del patrimonio storico. E l'obiettivo di questa ricerca è quello appunto di. Ehm, 
per restituire una fotografia di questo mondo ampio e variegato e di testimoniare l'alta competenza raggiunta dal nostro paese in questo caso specifico. Il nostro lavoro di ricerca qualche mese fa è partito da un dato che è stato poi ehm, confermato da tante persone che abbiamo coinvolto, ossia che in Italia più che in altri paesi eh, la cultura della conservazione del patrimonio storico è insita nell'identità nazionale e incrocia non solo saperi e innovazione ma anche appunto le evoluzioni. Questa cultura ha avuto modo di evolversi nel tempo. E, Soprattutto grazie ad un'esperienza centenaria di interventi fatti su un patrimonio eh, estremamente eh, ampio e variegato. E, e grazie a questa esperienza eh, è riusciti quindi a mettere insieme due elementi fondamentali. Da un lato l'innovazione tecnica e dall'altro una capacità storica di di Questo ha permesso ai nostri risultati eh, non solo di conservare ma di tramandare le generazioni future in modo che siano ricevute e comprensibili anche rispetto al contesto storico e di relazioni che questi beni hanno nei luoghi in cui sono inseriti. Grazie a questa sensibilità straordinaria, i restauri italiani sono apprezzati e premiati nel mondo, non da ultimo, eh, è quello appunto che mi ha preceduto appena citato, l'European Heritage Award 2020 ha premiato un'esperienza italiana, quella della Basilica di Santa Maria con le maggio dell'Asia, che eh, è stata purtroppo distrutta dal terremoto del 2009 dell'Aquila, che grazie a questo intervento complesso è stato però grado di eh, restituire questo bene di importanza storica per la cittadinanza, anche perché qui eh, si svolge un evento eh, molto importante per il mondo eh, cristiano cattolico, quello della perdonanza l'unico giubileo che è realizzato al di fuori di Roma. Eh, la di questo cartiere di restauro è stato appunto quello di aver garantito la cittadinanza anche durante i lavori di restauro per la realizzazione di questo evento importante e eh, essere riusciti a portare a termine in soli due anni un intervento così complesso, grazie soprattutto a una fortissima collaborazione tra diversi soggetti, eh, l'istituzione pubblica, cioè la sovrintendenza archeologia delle belle arti e paesaggio dell'Aquila, all'epoca guidata da Alessandra Vittorini, eh, che appunto ha collaborato con un pool di università italiane Tecnico di Milano, l'Università della Sapienza di Roma, l'Università dell'Aquila e non da ultimo Player, una grande azienda italiana, l'ENI, che ha finanziato eh, questo restauro e che oltre a mettere a disposizione le risorse economiche ha messo a disposizione il know-how eh, dei propri ingegneri e dei propri geologi. Quindi per dare voce a questo mondo eh, abbiamo quindi deciso di realizzare questo rapporto, eh, rapporto che cerca quindi di eh, dare visibilità non solo alle opere restaurate ma eh, per una volta anche ai protagonisti, a chi ci sta dietro quindi ha uh, un mondo fatto di uh, imprese che realizzano uh, tecnologie e materiali innovative, che realizzano gli interventi di restauro, le studi di diagnostica, studi di progettazione focalizzati in questo caso, e uh, ovviamente il mondo uh, della ricerca e della formazione. Eh, per la selezione di queste 100 realtà, perché attraverso il racconto di 100 storie di innovazione che abbiamo voluto restituire e dare voce a questa filiera. Eh, queste 100 realtà eh, le abbiamo selezionate eh, seguendo una metodologia utilizzata nella prassa internazionale, la metodologia OX, quindi siamo partiti da una serie di interviste fatte a un opinion leader del settore, che ha permesso di eh, raccogliere le prime informazioni eh, per appunto raccogliere un primo gruppo di imprese cosiddette explorative case studies da cui poi abbiamo selezionato 100 realtà sulla base di parametri legati alla sostenibilità, all'innovatività e all'impatto sociale. Ovviamente il risultato 
The result. Uh, è una fotografia di insieme che non vuole essere esaustiva, ma solo rappresentativa della qualità del settore. E, uh, diciamo così, anche se uh, l'intento è stato quello di raccontare uh, tutta la filiera nella sua varietà, sicuramente molto spazio uh, è stato dato a un segmento specifico, quello uh, delle uh, realtà che cercano di sviluppare uh, metodologie e uh, materiali per la messa in sicurezza. Perché proprio questo segmento, proprio per le caratteristiche del nostro paese, cioè quello di essere quasi nella sua interezza, un paese esiste. E proprio per questo motivo, a partire già dalla metà degli anni Ottanta, molte sono italiane che hanno cercato di industrializzare alcuni sistemi messi a punto dalle università e questo ha permesso la diffusione di consolidamento e di ricevimento degli impalcati sia eh, legno orizzontali e sia verticali in muro al punto che nella uh, metà degli anni 80 le prime applicazioni al mondo dei materiali compositi per il rapporto strutturale eh, proprio in questo ambito del recupero architettonico sono state fatte appunto nel nostro paese ugualmente Abbiamo cercato di dare spazio a tutte quelle realtà che stanno cercando di implementare materiali e tecnologie per aumentare l'efficienza eh, degli edifici in muratura, pur nella consapevolezza che questi edifici non raggiungeranno mai le performance gli edifici realizzati con materiali più moderni, ma tantissime sono appunto le realtà che si stanno muovendo in, questo, in questa direzione per fare l'impatto dell'edificio eh, non a caso, eh, il primo protocollo al mondo che certifica eh, la sostenibilità nel recupero dell'edilizia storica è stato eh, messo in punto dalla sezione italiana di un'organizzazione internazionale, il Green Building Council Italia. Il che ha ottenuto questo protocollo è stato appunto il strumento italiano, eh, ovvero il monastero benedettino eh, della Rocca Santa Bonicare in provincia di Benedetto. Le nostre pratiche legate alla sostenibilità sicuramente avranno modo di crescere, sicuramente per la parte privata, grazie anche alla conversione in legge del decreto di lancio che prevede il eh, super bonus al 110%. E poi abbiamo cercato. Eh, di dare eh, spazio in questo rapporto eh, che vedete che avete modo di scaricare direttamente eh, online della nostra fondazione eh, a centrifugare eh, di, eh, di, eh, di formazione eh, di discussa eh, fama del mondo dall'ufficio delle pietre all'istituto centrale di Roma a cui poi si sono aggiunte una serie di facoltà di universiti che si sono uscite a partire dall'Università uh, dall della Sapienza di Roma, che nel 1919 è stata la prima facoltà a, uh, fondata ad aver inserito un insegnamento accademico uh, focalizzato sul territorio dei monumenti mettendo così insieme discipline legate all'ingegneria, agli studi umanistici e alle belle arti. Per supportare e sostenere questa filiera, eh, strategici e molto importanti sono i eh, lavori di alcuni soggetti privati eh, per la produzione eh, questa, per la eh, eh, sto riferendo eh, ovviamente eh, per la parte pubblica eh, all'Agenzia eh, Italiana eh, di Interazione e Sviluppo, per la parte privata eh, ad Astori eh, Stauro, cioè eh, l'associazione di categoria eh, che dal 2005 rappresenta il settore. Il loro lavoro è fondamentale per la nascita e lo sviluppo di scuole, di formazione, di ricerca, di modello di quello italiano e per la crescita di eh, collaborazioni tra le professionalità italiane e locali. Uh, anche grazie alla collaborazione per concludere direi che queste 100 storie raccontate in questo report uh, testimoniano che l'Italia è in campo nell'inizia uh, del futuro e che si può trovare uh, gra grazie alla messa a valore la messa a sistema di questa filiera uh, uh, anche per uh, poter ripartire e uh, superare 
superare la crisi, anche alla luce della eh, necessità di costruzione di quello che eh, si figura come eh, il cantiere di restauro tra i più grandi del mondo, cioè ehm, purtroppo aperto da una serie di terremoti che ha colpito l'Italia, il centro Italia, eh, the Central Italy as a large uh, site involving restoration. Grazie, thanks, thanks a lot. Now we are going towards the conclusions of this afternoon and uh, we have now Alessandro Bozzetti, president of Astro Restauro. Thank you very much. Good evening to everybody. Now, first of all, I'd like to thank the president of the Italian trade agency, Carlo Ferro, and the undersecretary to foreign affairs, Manlio Di Stefano. Now, as all previous speakers, uh, I appreciated very much what they said, the content, their content, but also their proposals. Now, I'll show some slides as well to describe what Alstor Restauro does, who we are, perhaps to those who still don't know us. It is an association of uh, restorers uh, who operate in the protection uh, of uh, art uh, and of uh, cities. Um, uh, we operate with great competence. We were the first Italian association in terms of uh, the production of materials, of techniques, and of services aimed at cultural heritage, both in Italy, but also abroad. Now, our association is made up of uh, experts who produce materials, companies, who are involved with restoration, uh, experts in projecting, experts in diagnostics, and also in uh, services of augmented reality and other services uh, aimed at uh, promoting cultural heritage. Now, at this point, I'd like to uh, underline those activities that Asso Restauro was involved with uh, also abroad. Thanks to the contribution of the Italian Trade Agency of uh, ICE. So, I'll repeat. I'd like to explain what Asso Restauro has been doing also abroad with the great su support of uh, the Italian Trade Agency. And uh, we do so in various ways. We have indeed provided a great contribution, for example, in uh, Russia for the restoration of the Brandenburg uh, uh, Gate in uh, Lebanon, in Turkey, with the restoration of the uh, clock tower, and uh, in uh, Fatish, the Suleiman, but also in Cuba. We are about to complete a restoration of a small building near the Piazza Vecchia, which uh, will host a, a center for restoration and design, a center where uh, the Italian companies will uh, be able to share, to pool their competences and make them available to uh, local experts. Furthermore, we have contributed with the American PTI. In fact, we have uh, created the PT Europe, thanks to their help. So all of this, of course, was possible thanks to the great support that we have received from the Italian Trade Agency, from ICE. Alone, we would never have been able to achieve these very important results. Now, just a couple of words on this uh, week, on the Restoration Week that was held throughout various uh, cities in uh, Italy. Now, Monday we were in Amatrice, in the morning we were to be in Città Ducale, in a deposit uh, where all of the goods uh, salvaged from uh, 
the earthquake were placed. But unfortunately, due to the shortcomings of COVID, we could not go there. We did go to Amatrice. We uh, heard uh, the special superintendent for earthquake engineer Paolo Lianelli, who uh, actually reported over the situation of uh, the uh, securing and reconstruction of the area. In the morning, we visited the Basilica di Colemaggio. As we heard uh, some minutes ago, it received uh, the award of Europa Nostra. And in fact, it is a, a very positive example of restoration, which has uh, returned the Basilica to its initial splendor. And then uh, Santo Stefano di Sestagno, the uh, reconstruction, the uh, restoration of uh, a, an ancient uh, town, historical town, which was restored in a very conservative way, uh, such that it now has come back to its splendors. It receives a lot of visitors, and that too is a splendid example of restoration. And we had the honor of uh, uh, hearing, uh, among others, also the Minister for Cultural Heritage from Albania. The following day, we went in a palace in Rome, Palazzo Silvestri, Rivaldi, uh, very close to the Colosseum. It is a palace that for uh, many issues was abandoned for many years, but now thanks uh, to Minister Franceschini, to our uh, ministry, we were able to actually uh, help uh, uh, bring back bring it back to life uh, with uh, a whole set of uh, restoration activities. On the following day, we went to the church of uh, San Giuseppe di Falignami, a uh, church that is placed at the very center of Rome. It is very dear to Romans in 2018, at the end of August. Uh, unfortunately, its roof, uh, two thirds of it collapsed uh, with uh, uh, this uh, beautiful roof that uh, unfortunately went destroyed, but after two years, we will, were, were able to actually give it back to uh, the Roman citizens. And now, today, the last day, we are here with uh, special tables uh, being held over various topics. topics. So we're very proud indeed of this edition of the Restoration Week. So this is just a summary that I've made over the uh, things that we have uh, witnessed uh, uh, over this very intense week. Now, I'd like to uh, thank uh, uh, the organizers of uh, the Italian Trade Association Agency and Asso Restauro for, uh, because they were able to achieve two objectives. First of all, they were able to overcome the issues uh, due, caused by COVID, uh, and they were able, uh, despite that, to involve uh, so many different players, uh, mm, which uh, otherwise would not have been able to meet physically. And then we hope that this format, in fact, uh, for the next editions, will continue to be adopted, of course, uh, with uh, uh, required uh, uh, improvements. Uh, which are always possible. That said, uh, as a president of Asso Restauro, I'm uh, very glad of, of all the things been dealt with in this uh, edition. I've heard with great interest the, what was said in the various tables, and I'm very glad indeed that uh, Asso Restauro was able to pull in their competence competences in order to allow restoration and reconstruction to actually provide a positive contribution to the made in Italy as a whole. Now, restoration and, uh, and is a very important when talking about made in Italy. And as Asso Restauro, we are undoubtedly very keen in continuing in this process uh, in uh, promoting restoration, which is a piece and parcel of Made in Italy. Thank you very much, and I'm looking Presidente forward to Bozzetti, you again next year with the, siamo with the next alle domande. Intanto ne abbiamo qualcuna che viene dalle chat. Se poi 
qualcuno vuole intervenire me lo dica uh, io uh, hi doc uh, i'm sorry uh, we have now uh, the at the moment of the questions uh, we have one from the chat for miss uh, facelli uh, of the uh, of the European Commission. Ms. Pacelli, what are the funding, uh, the, or what fundings uh, the, Europe, the European Commission is allocating for the direct uh, uh, restoration of the existing and cultural context? Thank you for the question. This is indeed a very relevant one because it doesn't have a simple answer. And I believe the, the person who uh, asked the question knows that too. So the um, thing is, cultural heritage it is um, in a co-management, uh, sorry, the funds that can be actually uh, allocated for restoration and conservation of cultural heritage are under a co-management between uh, the European Union and uh, the member states, meaning uh, the European uh, structural funds especially the regional development funds, which means that the European Union allocates them in a very complex uh, <laughs> um, decision method that I will not here enter into the details, but each member state then um, decided how to use them and presents projects that, uh, that the Commission eventually will evaluate. Um, we can speak for the um, uh, programming period 2014, um, sorry, 2007-2014, uh, and say that indeed 6 billion euros uh, have been allocated for culture and cultural heritage in the EU. Uh, for the investment in the development and promotion of culture, cultural heritage and the creative industries. Uh, interventions range from the recovery uh, of abandoned villages uh, to the rehabilitation of historic um, uh, towns to the uh, improved accessibility of heritage sites. Particularly the EU Interreg program supports cross-border international cooperation projects uh, that fund heritage. Investments also on cultural heritage can be found um, in the Urbect uh, projects. And these are very popular topics indeed. But just to give a national example, uh, in the Preserving Pompeii, great project, out of the 105 uh, million euros that have been allocated for the preservation and enhancement of the site, 80 over two thirds have been provided by the EU through the structural funds. Um, now, how the member states uh, use the funds is indeed a national prerogative, but um, we support very much uh, this type of use. And in this sense, um, uh, just last year, uh, uh, some guidelines on the quality principle uh, for you funded interventions with an impact um, on cultural heritage uh, have been released, working together with the ECOMOS. So this is also a report I would like uh, to flag because it encompasses um, quite a number of case studies uh, where we can see what you suggested a appropriate use of this funding. Thank you. I hope it's clear. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, we have even from the chat a question for uh, Mr. Wamba Sameh Nagib Wamba of the World Bank. Uh, Mr. Wamba, I'm reading. World Bank, what is the value of uh, restoration in the policies of the World Bank? Um, I think I uh, did touch uh, on this uh, aspect in, in my presentation for us. Um, restoration, conservation is a means to an end. Uh, so uh, in what, what really matters to us, uh, because what we focused on is basically alleviating poverty and reducing the inequalities that are affecting the bottom 40% of the population. So what we're really focusing on is, you know, how the conservation and the uh, protection and preservation of these assets can enable job creation, can enable economic development. So, so that leveraging effect, how can we convert an asset into uh, an you know, income generating asset into 
and uh, economic opportunity is the, the, the main emphasis. So, so logically, that makes uh, conservation a means to an end. I hope that answers uh, the question. Uh, we are now at the uh, conclusions. I uh, would like to have here Mr. Roberto Lovato of the uh, ICE Agencia uh, for the conclusions. Yes, uh, good evening. Just a few words in order to summarize uh, the, the day. First of all, I want to thank you uh, on behalf of uh, Italian Trade Agency and uh, the first uh, words that, 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 that comes to my mind is uh, regeneration, regenerazione, as a new philosophy of uh, restoration. The meaning is uh, to have uh, a new birth for a building, a monument, or an artifact. in order to give it back to the population, to the real owner of this uh, heritage. The second uh, word is uh, partnership. Because uh, in my opinion, it is extremely clear that uh, Above all, in this sector, in uh, restoration, is uh, extremely important the role of the role of collaboration. Put together expertise from different uh, parts and uh, project a new uh, to to to, to get the, a new a new project and uh, it is extremely important to put together expertise from different country and from different parts and uh, as I said uh, uh, the Under Secretary Di Stefano, this is a uh, win-win uh, strat strategy because uh, each partner could benefit of uh, the work, the job of the other. The, they put together their works and obtain a good result. A extremely major result as they put together the single, the, the work of each partner. So, uh, we believe that uh, partnership, uh, collaboration are very, very strong commitment for us. Our uh, agency gives the availability to all our partners, to all the countries that they are online in this moment, at this moment, our availability in order to develop new projects, in order to give the possibility 
of uh, for uh, Italian companies to develop their business, but at the same time to give the to help to develop new com new competence, new knowledge in all, in all uh, the countries in which we operate. So uh, I want to thank again all the participants. I want to invite them to join us in order to achieve a new project. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you to all. Thank you to uh, the people who uh, followed us uh, by a remote. We can say uh, that uh, the, this diplomacy of the uh, heritage restoration is going on uh, from uh, Rome in uh, these days. And we hope that the slogan in the future will be our heritage is our future. Our future is our heritage. Thank you, thank you so much. And let's say uh, to the next chances to join together.